Um, I wanted to start off with um, with a picture of this guy of, of George Floyd because I think that you know I mean I I remember the first time it really came home to me was um, the Rodney King incident and riots and response. Um, I had just left Los Angeles when that that all happened, and. Um, my my old armory um, was in Culver City, and if you know LA, that's that's down in the area where um, actually that's the neighborhood that the guy got drugged from the truck and killed during the riots. Um, and my my old buddies, um, my my old unit was one of the National Guard units that was. Um, <laughs> they weren't just called out; they were under siege. Um, but, you know, Rodney was a guy with a name. And, what you know, thankfully he didn't die. And, you know, of course he's, he's uh, famously quoted as, as saying, you know, can't, can't we all just get along? Um, and, and sadly, you know, the answer is I guess not. Because in the years that have passed since then, um, what happened to him has been proven to be less of an anomaly and more of um, the way things are. It's just that uh, the ubiquitousness of uh, cameras, you know, since everybody now has a phone that has a camera in it, um, we're, we're beginning to see what, what America actually is. And it's not pretty. Um, And so I wanted to share this. Um, it's, a, it's a video about George Floyd. He would say that he's a man of God. He would stand on that firmly. He was a very loving person. Um, and he didn't deserve what happened to him. Our young generation is clearly lost, man. Clearly lost, man. Like, like, I don't even know what to say no more, man. Like, you youngsters just going around, just busting guns in crowds, kids getting killed. One day it's gonna be you and God. You going up or you going down. You know what I'm saying? That's gonna be it. My heart hurt. Floyd well, was my brother, man. We called each other twin, bro. My brother only was out there in Minnesota. Was, he was trying to, he was changing his life. He went to Minnesota, he was driving trucks. Oh, he would tell his friends, like, come up to Minnesota, man. You can, you can do it here. Like, you can, you can, you know, you can get a job and, and you can start fresh and, and this is the place to do it. family. I can't take nothing back. I can't get my brother back. They at home. They sleep. They with their wives. They got kids. 
if something like that happened to them, they'll be just like me. Firing them is 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 a good start, but we want to see justice for our family. What they did was was murder, and almost the whole world has witnessed that. We need justice for my brother. They need to be convicted of murder. I can imagine. My brother would not be able to sleep at night this happened to me. And it hurts me deep. to see them charged with murder. And we want them to be convicted. We want them arrested. They need to pay for what they did. Um, he didn't deserve what happened to him. And they didn't do anything to help him. They were supposed to be there to serve and to protect. And I didn't see a single one of them lift a finger to do anything to help. While he was begging for his life, not one of them tried to do anything to help him. That I didn't see. What I did see was murder, and that's what I want them to be arrested and charged and convicted for. It definitely warms my heart to see that um, we have so many people um, willing to support and to uh, protest and to give him a voice um, and and keep this this going because um, he was a very loving person um, and he didn't deserve what happened to him. Um, so yes, we are we are definitely um, even overwhelmed because we we didn't expect to have the kind of support that we have. I love my brother. Everybody loves my brother. Knowing my brother is to love my brother. They could have tased him. They could have maced him. Instead, they would they put their knee in his neck and just sat on him and didn't care at all. He screamed, mama, mama, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. So I don't, I don't, I just don't understand what more we gotta go through in life, man. They didn't have to do that to him. He's a jump giant. They took a life, now they deserve life. I know that was kind of long, but you know, I really wanted to, to get a sense for just that one man, you know, just, just, um, you know, who he was. And so this, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the slideshow for right now, because I want to give us all a chance if anybody's having feelings about, you know, about him and about what happened to him. And if, if you'd like to have a place to share that. You know, this is the time because I'll, I'll tell you, I, I watched that and, and it made me sick. Um, you, you know, it was like, it, it looked like at one point you could just see that he was dying, that, you know, that, that, that there was a, like this shocked look in his eyes and it, it's, I, I, I Watching man's inhumanity to man is, um, you, you want to, my, my brain just doesn't even want to try to register it. It's, it's like, it's like, I'm, I'm trying to believe it's not, it's not true, but there it is it's right in front of you. And it just, um, I'm still processing it, you know, to be honest. I had the same feelings. Like, I don't know. I always, when there's an incident like this, I try to watch the video to have like, I guess, a, a full understanding of the situation and what was going on. And 
I mean, I just, I can't make sense of, I can't make sense of the officer who had, who was kneeling on him. I can't make sense of his just complete unconcern. And I don't know his smugness. It's almost like he was smug as he was sitting there and, you know, like, I don't know, just, and and the other officer, like, hasn't been charged, and he was standing right there, and he just wouldn't look. I mean, he didn't, they kept telling him, look at him, he can't breathe, he's, you know, his nose is bleeding, he's, there's something wrong, and that officer just wouldn't even look, <laughs> and I don't know, I just, I feel so frustrated for I don't, I, and the more we see, like, there it appears there have been, like, multiple complaints for brutality against this particular officer yeah. and his partner, and it's just, I don't know, I just, I don't even know how to deal with, with the, with the feelings I have about it, I guess, yeah. because it just seems so pointless and stupid that these people were allowed to continue on as officers when you know, this is clearly not the first time that this sort of thing has happened on their watch. And, and it's just, it was, I don't know, it was inhumane. And yeah. I guess, like, It, it's it's profoundly horrifying but also not surprising yeah i i that's the thing that's the thing that really bothers me about it is how not surprising it was yeah yeah and i wish it was i wish it was one of those things where i was like oh, yeah i'm shocked i'm not shocked this is this is normal you know? Yeah. And these are just the ones we've seen, just the ones we have recordings of. Yeah, exactly. Right. It doesn't even scratch the surface. No, I, I've got a couple of slides that, and I, I found some other statistics that I, I didn't end up putting on some of the slides that I did create. And, and there are hundreds of people that um, have died in the past, you know, X number of years due to mm -hmm. police brutality. And, you know, the thing is, 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 um, you know, it's, it's not even like uh, it was a re like he was really being confrontational and they, they couldn't control him. I mean, there's no reason that 30 seconds after they had him on the ground, they didn't, they shouldn't, they should have had him in handcuffs, had him back up and had him in the back seat of the car and on the way to the station, if that's what they were going to do. There was, the I mean, only resisting he was doing on the ground was trying to get where he could breathe. And you could tell that like easily in the yeah. video. It wasn't like he was rolling his whole body. He was a big guy. He could have knocked that guy off him. But. Yeah. So. He was trying to comply and they just, just ignored that. Yeah. I never and it was almost thought. like it was for, you know, I'll show you sort of mentality yeah yeah i never would have thought in a million years that when i was checking bills for counterfeit as a cashier that that would have been the outcome right i, yeah. I never would have thought that it, it never happened so i never had to see what the response of like our manager or boss would be but i would lie if i had known anything like that would happen yeah yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's, that's something that, that I was just doing at, at my last little part-time job, you know. We, we checked every bill that came in to be, you know, as to whether or not it was counterfeit. I mean, it's a, even if he, even if it was counterfeit, it's a non-violent crime. There was no reason yeah. for that response. And like, I just, it's horrifying. It's horrifying that that's, And, and like Laura said, it's not surprising. Like, it didn't surprise me that it happened. 
but it was still just horrifying to watch. And I guess it's, you know, I've seen videos before of things like this happening, but it was the first time like I could see the light leave someone's eyes almost, yeah. you know, and it's just. Yeah. It's, uh... Well, I just had a few other um, things I wanted to share. So, you know, in, in Unity, um, we have this concept called divine order. And, um, you know, I. I'm in a unity minister discussion group and, and one of my colleagues was talking about, you know, they were going to talk about divine order this weekend. And I, I'm, I have no idea how they were going to address it, but I just wanted to point out that a lot of people have the mistaken idea that divine order means that everything is working out exactly the way God planned it to, right? Like God is some, you know, big puppet master in the sky and you know already has the whole thing figured out and that's that's not what i was taught and it's not what i believe you know what i was taught is that divine order actually means the law of cause and effect and that for every cause there's an effect and for every effect there was a cause so when we look at what's going on you know, racially in America right now. I think it's helpful to understand some of the causes of what lead us to where we're at. And on this slide, um, you can see that black America and white America at a very basic level don't live the same life, you know, to how long they will live. If the average number of people, you know, black men getting to the age of 75 is less than 50% when it's more than, you know, almost 63% for whites. The, the income numbers are, are really shocking. The average household income for the white population is over $60,000. For the black population, it's just over $34,000. It's just barely a little over half. The number of people living in poverty is three times as many almost for blacks. It's, this is evidence of pervasive injustice. There's almost no other way of putting it. And when we look at, at what's actually happening right now, at what happened to George, you know, you ask yourself, well, what does it mean to live in constant fear? Because, you know, most of us who are white don't have any understanding of what that's like. So this is a real simple statistic. You know, unarmed, unarmed, and that's a key word, unarmed black people were killed by police at five times the rate of unarmed whites in 2015, which was the last time I could get the, uh, the statistics for there, five times. And that doesn't does that doesn't take into account um, the percentage of whites and blacks, does it? That, I mean, that's just raw numbers, right? That's no, that's that's um, per million people. Okay. So yeah, no, actually, um, I interestingly, um, police have killed about twice as many whites as blacks over the past, um, eh, you know, six, seven years that I could find statistics on. Um, but then when you realize that blacks only make up 13% of the population. And that's still dis disproportionate. It's, it's still completely disproportionate. And so this next slide um, really kind of lays it out. Groups most likely to be killed by law enforcement 
and the, the group most likely is young African American men. Native Americans also are killed at an extremely higher proportion um, but because they're such a small proportion of the overall population and um, many of their deaths are um, in extremely remote areas and a lot of people standing around don't have a cell phone to take uh, pictures. We don't see those. But um, it, it's, it's pretty obvious. And, you know, the thing is, is most of us in the white community don't even understand when we are talking to a police officer or a sheriff or, you know, whatever, you know, state police when we get pulled over out on the interstate for speeding or whatever it might be. We are in fear of our lives and we don't understand that that's privilege. You know, when you, when we talk to other white people about privilege and they're like, oh, I'm not privileged. You know, Nobody helped me out. Well, you, you, no, you don't get it. You just don't understand. It's a whole different level of being alive in this country. That, One of that the ways I loved having that explained was saying that you have privilege isn't saying that you haven't faced obstacles. It's saying that your skin color wasn't one of them. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. <sighs> you know, I, I worry about, well, I worry about violence for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, people get hurt. I, I'm, I'm very, I don't want to see people get hurt, okay? Um, but a lot of us people that, you know, like guys like me that have white skin, you know, are, up, you know, they're, they're upset that, um, that some of these protests have turned violent. And we know, we now know that some of those protests have turned violent because people with white skin. Different talk for a different day. But it's funny that some of those same people are, you know, people who call themselves defenders of freedom and they would strap on an AR-15 and go to their, uh, their governor's mansion, right? Because they're demanding the, the right to go to the bowling alley or go to the barber, right? And we, we tend to forget our own past where, you know, people got a little violent. And, um, you know, since I am a minister and sometimes people ask, well, what would Jesus do? Well, <laughs> you know, so, you know, um, destroying a place of business was not outside the realm of possibilities, right? And, and one thing I, I wanted to point out when I showed this picture is that right before this happened, I mean, literally almost just like right before it in the pages of the, of, of the Gospels, it describes him sitting down to dinner with people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the the, the temple leaders and the, you know, people he called lawyers or the, the word that now get, uh, gets, a temp, uh, um, that gets interpreted as lawyers. Um, and, and he's saying, woe to you guys. And I think I, I actually pulled out the quotes from the Bible last week or the week before. Woe to you guys because you're not getting it, right? Well, you know, he tried that, you know, and finally he had to go into the temple and, you know, turn over the bankers tables and start whipping some people with some knotted ropes because they were paying attention when he was being polite and having dinner with them. Right. And we look at, at all the things that have happened in our society to, you know, the, the uh, continuing unemployment of Colin Kaepernick who started the, the, you know, the protest of kneeling in the NFL during the national anthem. This is all in divine order. There, there was a cause and there are effects. And we have to take the blinders off of our eyes and connect those two things together. You know, we have to understand that there is, you know, and, and, and you know, ask ourselves, am I responsible for any of those connections? Right? Or can I at least, you know, do something now to be of help, right? And I, I just wanted to point out, and this is the picture of, uh, of us at the uh, protest yesterday, that, you know, I am sure going to keep praying for safe and peaceful and effective resolution to what's going on out there on our streets right now. Um, because our, our country does not need to go to war against itself any more than it already is right now. We, we have got to try to keep this thing pulled together and 
you know, like one of the things you're going to do at the rally today, I was, I was told, is register people to vote, you know, because we have literally our lives and the life of our nation hangs in the balance this November. And we need to come together as a nation and get leadership that is going to bring about real change going forward. But I also wanted to take a look at this idea of being an ally and how, you know, those of us who are, are white um, can help make a difference. And, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, Laura especially helped helps me to, to see and understand is things like men don't get to decide what's misogynistic and straight people don't get to decide what's homophobic, et cetera, et cetera. White people don't get to decide what's racist. That's, we, 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 don't, we don't get to decide that. Um, people who are in positions of power don't get to decide what's considered oppression. So I know we're, we're a little past time, but I did want to, um, to share this, you know, so w I thought this was a pretty good one. And, and I wish we had some people of color, you know, on the, uh, on the service with us today so that they could help expand on these and, and, you know, maybe say how they felt about some of them. But, um, you know, listening, finding out, not taking over, not taking it personally, talking to other white people, interrupting jokes and comments about racism, you know, not being scared by, you know, ju certainly justified anger, putting our bodies on the line. Those are, those are all things that jump out at me at things that, you know, I as a white guy need to be doing. And if anybody else has any other things that we can do to be good allies, you know, speak up. There were a couple of things that I thought was, uh, that were really kind of cool. Um, I saw, I don't know if this picture was validated um, as a legit thing, but there was supposedly a picture of a bunch of white women who were standing, who formed a line and stood in between black protesters and police. Mm -hmm. I saw that too. I thought was really great. Um, and having that kind of solidarity is really great. Um, but also one of the things that I saw when I was doing like the anti-Muslim rhetoric got amped up after the idiot in the White House got elected. Um, one of the things that I saw as a recommendation for protecting someone um, of color when they're being aggressively targeted by police or someone else is to go over and start a conversation with that person, pretend like you're friends, right? Like, hey, I can't believe it's you. We saw each other last week. Remember, how's that thing going? Um, to kind of diffuse the, the situation, because if you can take the attention off of the situation, um, a lot of times whoever the bully is will go away. Um, pretending like you know somebody who's being targeted by racist bullies. And then um, I also saw a pretty good Twitter thread yesterday um, where white women kind of have an advantage with our privilege when it comes to dealing with the police, which is that they can always be afraid that we're related to someone important. And also we have a pretty serious stereotype as Karens, so they don't know when we're going to you know, go to the manager. So if we turn on our phone camera, get in between the cop and the person of color, and it's like, I want your, I want you think your badge number. I want to find out what's going on, you know, Karen out, but in favor <laughs> of people of color, that's, that's a tool that we can use. Yeah. That was a really good thread. I read that as well. And, and it said to make sure that you not just take the badge number, um, but text it to someone, let them see you're texting it to someone who's not there so that you have a record of it. Yeah. Right, so they can't just take your phone and break it. Yeah. Yeah. Or delete your video or, or whatever. Right. That's a really good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm texting this to my mom. And to my aunt Marjorie. Yeah. <laughs> she is close personal friends with the governor. I'll exactly. have you know. They go to the spa together. Right. Exactly. Exactly. 
Is that the kind of mess you want to be in? Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Is it? Okay, so I, 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 maybe I'm married to a professional Karen. I just, uh, you know, haven't been around to see it. We all have that potential. <laughs> we all do. We're born with it. All women, all white women are born with the capability of being. Gotcha. Ah, okay. Well, um, we, we've, we've gone a little over time today, so I will just wrap it up by um, saying that, um, you know, we have another opportunity to at least get out and show our support for um, our, our black brothers and sisters. Uh, today at four o'clock at Kelly Ingram Park, um, this is the, the actual uh, artwork that the city of Birmingham put out because the mayor's gonna be there. Awesome. And, um, you know, the idea is that we in Birmingham, you know, the place that used to be known of as Bombingham, um, we're, we're gonna show the world how this is done. We're going to show them what it looks like, you know, to mobilize um, and, and to do it together, you know, instead of against each other. So um, I will be there. Um, if you want to, when you get there, uh, shoot me a text. I've got my phone number on, you know, another slide. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll hook up. Um, it was nice to be able to hang out with uh, Nikki and Natalie yesterday. And uh, if any of you managed to make it over today, I will be glad to see you.